So guys, I got a confession to make. I've always been a nerd, and I always will be a nerd. When I was little, I can remember my parents taking me over to a friend or family member's house and asking the homeowner if I could crawl around underneath the kitchen sink. Now, the bewilderment on the homeowner's face was not lost on me, because you can imagine, they probably thought, oh my god, that kid's going down there to eat all my Tide Pods. <laughs> <clears throat> but in reality, I was just checking out their garbage disposal. Weird, I know, right? Thing is, is I've always been obsessed with everything mechanical, and more importantly, I wanted to know how these machines got their power. This ultimately led me to the discovery of nuclear energy. And when I found out about it, I begged and pleaded with my parents to take me to Ohio's two nuclear power plants, where we thought we could just stroll on up and get a tour. This wasn't the case, though. We were met with armed security guards and chased away. But even this did not shake my interest in the topic, because I was finding out all the incredible ways in which we use this technology. For example, NASA uses the decay of a very specific plutonium isotope to power the rovers on Mars, and are looking further into nuclear technology to help us propel our reach beyond our galaxy for deep space exploration missions and potential planetary colonization efforts in the future. It's also widely used in the medical field, not only for the ways in which we treat cancer, but also how we view it within our body. It's giving us a better understanding of how these terrible diseases interact with the human body and help us come up with better cures that take too many of us from this Earth too soon. Lastly, the U.S. Navy uses onboard nuclear reactors to power some of the world's largest ships and allow them to traverse the planet without requiring refueling for decades at a time, truly giving us a tactical advantage. Naturally, discovering all these things, I wanted to come to the Ohio State University, as anyone should, right? And this is our reactor, by the way. Uh, and while I always knew that this technology had a lot of benefit, I never realized how much was still left on the table until I started doing my research. My main research focuses on something called pyroprocessing, which is essentially a way of converting nuclear waste into an asset, because the only thing wasteful about nuclear waste is the fact that 95% of it can be reused. The problem is, however, that a lot of these reusable parts are intermixed with an unusable part, but thankfully, scientists way smarter than I were able to figure out a way to use magic, aka electricity and chemistry, to separate these unusable parts from the reusable parts in a badass term called pyroprocessing. And essentially what we can do is take this reusable part and put it into a special reactor to get electricity, and the unusable part is just safely stored. My research didn't just stop here, however, as I've also worked with health physics industries in coming up with better calibration methods for proton therapy. And proton therapy offers a distinct advantage over x-rays because proton therapy is able to concentrate its dose delivered to tumorous tissue rather than the healthy tissues around it. And we can kind of visualize this with the image behind us. And where you see that the light is the brightest is where we're concentrating that dose <coughs> from these protons. <coughs> so naturally, working with all these people, I was amazed at how passionate they were to see their ideas and how they wanted to see them succeed to their fullest potential. The problem is, though, is that even though this technology has changed so much since nuclear power's inception, the arguments against it have not. Why is that? Well, you've probably likely heard three of the main arguments against nuclear power. For starters, that the waste is an issue, and we have no means of dealing with it. But in reality, as I've already highlighted, we do have technical means of dealing with it. The problem arises is when we've tried to implement it, and bureaucracy stops, at, stops us at some point in the process. So if there's one takeaway here, is that the nuclear waste issue is not a technical issue. It is a bureaucratic issue. Secondly, the thing that you probably heard is that radiation is very dangerous and needs to be avoided at all costs. And while we begin to understand how radiation better interacts with the human body, we can put it into context with other aspects of our life that are much more dangerous, as studies now are suggesting that living in urban areas like London, or Columbus for that matter, are more dangerous to our health than living in the immediate surrounding areas of that of Chernobyl and Fukushima. And I know when I heard this for the first time, I remember thinking, it really sounds like a lot of the waste issue or the radiation issue has been overblown. And I can assure you that it has been. Lastly, a lot of people will tell us that we don't need nuclear technology in the future because wind and solar are our future. And while I agree that wind and solar, when it works, stands to benefit everybody, the problem is, though, is that if we want to be pragmatic in our approach and where we get our energy from the future, we have to look at real-world examples of where this technology has been implemented. And perhaps there's no better example of this than the two neighboring countries of France and Germany. 
France, in the 1970s, following the oil shocks, decided that they no longer wanted to be energy dependent. And over the course of a decade, were able to ramp up their nuclear generating capacity from practically nothing to over 80%. And they were able to do this in the course of 10 years, which is about the rate that you need to scale up clean energy if you're serious about combating the effects of climate change. Contrast this with Germany, however, who, post Fukushima, decided that they wanted to phase out their nuclear plants and replace them with renewables. But as we've seen over the last couple of years, is not only have their emissions remained stagnant, they've actually increased over the years. Why? The reason for this is because we always demand electricity, despite whether or not the wind blows or the sun shines. When we go to flip on the switch, we expect the light to turn on. And since there is no way of storing that much energy for an economy the size of Germany, and let's face it, if the Germans can't figure out an engineering way to do this, we're screwed. But if we don't have a means of storing it, then they use a backup source. And by and large, they've turned to com uh, combustion of coal. And that's precisely what they've done. So not only is their, ger is their energy 10 times dirtier than that in France, it's also about twice as expensive. It makes me think that if energy is to double by 2030 and perhaps quadruple by the end of the century, then we need to look at pragmatic examples like this and truly embrace a solution that's proven to work. All this aside, though, it doesn't matter all these examples because the nuclear industry, by and large, has a PR problem. A lot of times, myself included, are portrayed as these Monty Burns-esque type characters from The Simpsons that want to dump nuclear waste on your kid's playground and let them muck around in it. But really, nothing can be further from the truth. I wanted to do something about this. So I started the Radio Nuclear Podcast in which I interviewed the Monty Burns of the industries and got an idea of why they were interested in what they were doing, why they want this technology to succeed. The reason is, is because I, I was figuring out that these executives were just as interested in seeing this technology succeed as I did when I was a kid. And despite this, they're still portrayed as these buffoons that don't know what they're doing. It reminded me of a quote from Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard P. Feynman in his book, The Meaning of It All, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he said that to each scientific discovery is like being handed a key that can unlock the gates of either heaven or hell. And while surely, if used, misused or fallen into the wrong hands, we can use any scientific achievement nefariously. But how else are we supposed to make Earth a better place if we simply throw away the key and ignore it? What's amazing to me is that over the last couple of decades, we've been able, through science and technology, to lift more people out of extreme poverty than throughout our entire existence as a species. And this is all due to the fact that we use these keys to their full advantage. If we're quick to cast away such a promise, that is the nuclear promise, then we're really condemning those who have less than us to stay that way forever. If we want to share in our quality of life that we have here and hope for the best economic future possible for everybody, we need to utilize these nuclear keys. We need a nuclear future. Thank you.